Um, I'm going to talk a bit about. I'm going to talk about a uh, various parts of information retrieval infrastructure. Some of it might relate to what you've seen before in Barla's talk. Some of it is different. Some of it I'll go into a bit more detail on. Um, I will frame this in terms of what we could call an information retrieval pipeline. What is the process by which documents and queries pass through an IR system? And how can we, what are the common ways of, of, of dealing with the queries and dealing with the documents to make sure that we achieve an information retrieval system that is both efficient and effective? Why are both important? Well, it's easy to, to it's you, sometimes you can come up with new information retrieval techniques that might be very good for effectiveness. It might, they might um, help users find many more relevant documents or quicker, but if it, if it takes too long to apply these techniques, then it's not really, it's not, it's not really possible to, 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 to use them. So I'll talk about some of the techniques that are in common use that, that act at the trade-off between efficiency and effectiveness. That means things that can help us become more efficient without sacrificing effectiveness, and things that, become us, that help us become more effective without sacrificing too much efficiency. Um, I'll talk a bit more about distributed retrieval and moving into more real-time indexing structures. So how, how can we deal with data streams that are coming in all the time? So, the core components of an information retrieval system. So, we have some kind of document source, this collection that we're wanting to process. Um, and we collect that and we pass it to an indexer. The indexer creates some data structures that helps it go back and that it, that it can easily access. Then for a query from a user, enters the retrieval side of the framework and the retrieval side of the framework uses that index to retrieve results. These results are then rendered, that means we put on some snippets, we put on the title to, make, to help the user believe that that document is relevant and present them back to the user. So if we instantiate this in, in terms of web search, we'll be talking about a web crawler. An index an indexer to convert those web documents into a, some kind of searchable index, as well as retrieval algorithms and renderers that are appropriate for a web search environment. So I'm going to focus on the two main components, the indexing and the retrieval, which have the most impact on the quality of the results. Developing an IR system is a question of these trade-offs. How can you find the best results for a user and still do that quickly to satisfy that user? Okay? So, I'll talk about many, um, many techniques, but much of this research has been, uh, much research has been done to, to identify the best architectures, the best ways of implementing this infrastructure. And with different assumptions. And these assumptions are manifested in the different platforms that are available. The open source ones and, and, and the commercial ones such as real web search engines. Okay? I've been fairly agnostic I'm being quite agnostic to the choice of platform, but um, I would advise you to use and explain an existing platform during your research, okay? We want you as information retrieval scientists to be empiricalists. That means you have an hypothesis and you go and test that as quickly as possible. You can only do that if you are up to the state of the art as, as quickly as you can. If you spend time implementing a retrieval platform, if you spend time working out the bits um, the bits of doing compression in, a, in an IR platform, then you're not going to progress in your PhD as, quick, as, as quickly as you could. So please, do build upon this existing research instantiated in some of these platforms, rather than implementing the wheel. If you do have to pick a platform, then 
One particular platform that you may wish to consider is, of course, Terrier. Um, Terrier comes from the University of Glasgow, but you, you heard Barla earlier say that he and Yahoo Research has used it for some of his research. And in fact, we've had um, thousands, tens of thousands of downloads of Terrier over the years, um, mainly from academic researchers like yourself looking for a platform in which they can implement some new idea in information retrieval research. Okay? So we've spent a lot of time in the last 15 odd years adding and ensuring that the platform has both classical IR infrastructure and modern techniques. Okay? So for instance, compressed index structures and the ability to scale up to incredibly large corpora using MapReduce indexing. It also has many of the standard weighting models that you'll hear about this week from TFIDF to BM25 to things like Markov random field proximity models along with learning to rank. So I'll talk a wee bit more about that later. I myself have done some, I've done various research on testing some of these infrastructure techniques um, building upon and extending Terrier and I'll, and I'll link into interesting papers that um, support some of the best practices for implementing IR infrastructures as we go. So, the index is responsible for building an efficient structure that enables fast search for a user query, called this index. So, what happens when a document arrives? We need when, you need to, when a document arrives, we need to understand what format it is in, whether it's HTML or PDF. Once we have something that knows how to parse that type of document, then, we, then we're working down at the, at the level of individual terms. Um, so in, in, in language like English, that's very easy. A, the A space information space retrieval system, it's very easy to tokenize on, on, on spaces. Um, the, of course, other languages are, are more complex, like Chinese, where something like a bigram might be more indicative of, of a word boundary. Okay. We might apply some transformations to the terms to make subsequent searching easier, such as removing stop words or applying stemming. And then we need to index the terms that occur in the document. So that means record which terms that that particular document contains. Okay. What are the particular data structures that we might use within our index? Um, so. I've enumerated them here. We have the lexicon. It records a list of all the unique terms and their statistics. Unique terms so that we know if our collection contains a word and if it does, what is its frequency? For instance, that helps us calculate the IDF component or the background in a language model. We need what might be called the document index, recording a list of all documents and their statistics. Statistics such as the length of the document. This is important if you have if you have document length normalization, which is an important component of most weighting models. And finally, we have the inverted index. The inverted index gives us the mapping between terms and documents. Okay? So given a query term, I can see which documents that, that occurred in. Let's look a wee bit more detail at the formats of these. So in the lexicon we might have a list of a list of items with the following. A term, maybe a, a unique identifier for that term, and the frequencies with which it occurs in the collection. And the final thing, a pointer. The document index, some kind of representation for the document, maybe its length. And then in inverted index, we have a list of what we call postings. The posting lists for a given term represent all the documents in which that term occurs. So for this term, we have the pointer at the end of the lexicon tells us whereabouts in the inverted index we should start looking. Okay? And it tells us this is the list of all the document IDs in which this term occurs. So, a posting list, one or more postings for, that, for, for, for a given term. 
A posting usually cont contains at least the frequency of wh at which the term occurs. It might also contain other information. Other information such as the positions at which the term occurs. That helps us later do phrasal search or proximity search. It might also tell us the types of fields or zones in which that term occurs. So, for instance, this term appears in the title of the document. That might make it more, more um, appropriate for some queries. Or this, this term appears in the URL. The document index could also contain other information about the document that might be useful during ranking. Everybody's head of page rank, the number of in-links, etc. So that, that's where you might store that kind of information so that it's handy when you're ranking the document. Okay, so we've got the basic format of the index. And in fact, the class names that I've written in the courier font represent the exact class names that you would see if you looked in Terrier. And the format, you could recognize that just by looking at the data structures. When the, when the query comes in from the user, we need to use a, an algorithm to access the index structures and rank the documents that best match the user query. So, again, it's a pipeline process. We take this query, we run it through the, a similar tokenizer and apply the same kind of transformations that we apply to the documents. The transformations should always be the same so that we can match the document, the terms from the document with the terms from the queries. We might apply some other reformulations like adding some related words if we know about these. But um, essentially it's the same transformations that happen to each term whether they come from the document or come from the, come from the query. Then for each term in the query we need to apply a document retrieval model to score each document that contains one or more of these terms. And then optionally a re-ranking algorithm to incorporate any additional evidence. So, that's our basic architecture. We take some documents, we run it through a pipeline that gives us an index at the end of that batch of documents. And for retrieval, we're applying a very similar pipeline, except for the document, uh, we're, we're retrieving the documents from the index that match those query terms to make a, to, to, that we score appropriately and make a final set of results. Okay, so that's a basic premise of a search engine. How can we make it appropriately efficient? Smaller, better, and faster. Okay, so it's important to make retrieval as fast as possible. There's a, there's a few papers about this now. For instance, research by Bing indicates that if they slow the retrieval process, users looking at it actually think that the results are of lower quality, even if the results are unchanged. There's another study by Google that says that if you slow down the users, they stop coming back to the search engine for a while. So it's important that your search engine is fast enough that you're not annoying the users. So what's the most, the, the most costly part of a classical search engine? It's actually this bit in the middle, scoring each document for the user query. Why? Because our posting for... For a very large collection, our posting list can be very, very long, so it takes a while to process them. So, how can we make this bit faster? Yeah. Well, the reason for the expense of document scoring is there are lots of documents. A Google, Google a reportedly has trillions of pages. Um, more specifically, what is the cost of a search? Okay. The number of query terms. If you have a very long query, you're having to pass through many more posting lists. And of course, the length of the posting lists. The number of documents containing each of the query terms. So I'm going to talk about a couple of strategies that are just about always deployed to make sure that we have an efficient search architecture. One of these is caching. Okay. Um, we can cache the search result, 
So if we've seen that query before recently, we can just return the search result straight back to the use, straight back to the next user. We can also cache some of the the, the posting lists. Okay, so where possible, we're avoiding scoring documents. I'll also talk a bit about dynamic pruning. Okay, so we've, we've had to, where we're looking at the posting list, and um, we're having to score documents. If we prune, pruning means I'm going to avoid scoring documents that I know I'd never going that are never going to make it. Okay. And the final, and the next one is index compression. So reducing the time it takes to actually read a posting list. Okay, so caching strategies are built on the idea that we should store answers to past queries. Past answers can be used to bypass the scoring process for subsequent queries. So for popular queries, this is very effective. Remember that um, you were seeing the, the, the long tail distribution of query frequencies. Many queries are, are repeated by different users very regularly. So if we cache the results for those queries, we don't have to spend time servicing them. The alternative is if the, if your index is on a you know on a slow place like a disk, then you might then you can store the posting list for query terms that occur regularly. Okay, um, so it's caching is very effective at re reducing scoring. So, for instance, search result caching, uh, Ricardo really Yates said it could avoid fifty uh, scoring for fifty percent of queries, um, and if you're Caching posting lists, it, it can actually help for up to 88% of queries. One or more posting lists may already be in memory. So let's look at what that might mean. So a query arrives for search result caching, and you check the results cache. You, it's not there, so there's a miss. So you have to go and score the documents as normal. And once you've scored them, you can put those results back into the cache and keep them around for as, lo as long as you can, okay? So that means the next time you see that query, you'll get a hit from the cache and you can return that page verbatim. There is the page of results for this query. For a term caching, we're assuming that the index is on disk, and but we're keeping the posting list for some terms in memory. So, if all the terms of, are, are cached, we can go straight into the document retrieval. If it's not, then we can read some of them in from the disk and continue scoring as normal, while adding those posting lists back into the cache. Okay, so that, that was term caching up until about 10 years ago. And then, some, and then Moore's Law kind of caught up with that idea. And memory became cheaper and cheaper and cheaper to the consequence that, in fact, many search engines keep their entire index in memory. Okay, so it's like having a term, a term posting list cache for all for all query terms. Um, more recently, we now have SSDs as well. So we're actually getting to the point that we have three layers of storage that we can access. So we've got memory, where we're probably keeping most of our query terms. And we might have other stuff like SSDs or even maybe even a hard drive for keeping uh, results caches or other information on. Okay, so what could we use these for? Well, for many queries, phrases can be used to help the ranking. Okay, if we had bigram posting lists, we could score much quicker for these queries. Okay, so instead of just indexing single terms, we indexed all pairs of query terms. That, that could help with some queries, but the population of all bigrams in a collection is absolutely enormous. You could not possibly have an index for all bigrams. So, a common strategy instead is to only index a few bigrams comparatively. Basically, those that occur lots in the query log that you can get a benefit from. You can then cache their posting lists and use these to help speed up the query, okay? Um, 
So, for instance, there's a paper by Rizvik and all in Wisdom 2013. They inspect an incoming query and they decide that phrase might help, that phrase what might not help. Let me add that phrase. It's going to cost me a little bit more to go to the SSD, but I can score the entire query much quicker. So, how might we construct a paired posting list? So, let's consider the query. You've received the query White House clearly about uh, 1500 Pennsylvania Avenue. We can, it's clear that we would do better if we, if retrieving documents, if we were only looking for the terms where white and house appeared next to each other. Okay, so, but we don't have, a, we don't, we haven't indexed biograms, what could we do? So instead, we can use the posting lists for individual terms if they contain position information. Okay? So the term white appears in document zero in positions one and five. The, 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 the word house appears in document zero in positions two and six. So you can see that they occur adjacently. So you can, it's easy then at retrieval time to simulate a posting list for that biogram, okay? Without having to have a separate biogram posting list in the index. So then if, if it occurs that White House is a frequently occurring phrase in our query log, then the system can decide to cache that. So it says, look, if I draw a box around this and this, this looks like a posting list. Let me just stick that on the SSD. I can use that when I need it, when that query occurs. And that will save me ever having to look at White House, the white posting list and the term posting list, the white and the house posting list again. So even when we're using caching, we still need to score many documents, okay, if they're, for instance, they're not in the cache. So the, the normal way of doing this is you make a pass on the posting lists for each of the query terms. Now there are two ways that you can do this. You can do this one term at a time. So I've got the term white. I look at the posting list for all the documents containing the word white. And then I look at all the, all the documents in the posting list for the term house. The alternative, and which is more amenable to larger scale collections, is document at a time. In the, you process the posting list in parallel. Okay? So that means I'm looking at all the, at both of the query terms that contain, that match um, white and house at the same time before moving further on in the posting list. So we're scoring documents. We want to make that faster, okay? And we want to make that faster by only scoring documents when we have to, okay? So, dynamic pruning is, pr is probably one of the most frequently used ways of, ways of doing that, okay? The core assumption of a dynamic approach is that the user's only interested in looking at some top set of results. If you're in a web search engine, that might be just the top 20. Okay? We're only interested in looking at these top set of results. So when we're scoring then, we want to determine very quickly, as quickly as possible, if a document could never make that top key. And hence, if we can very quickly say it's not going to make the top key, then we stop scoring it right there and then. I don't need to score this document and no user is ever going to see it for this query. Okay? And we can do that without damaging the retrieval effectiveness. If it's not going to be retrieved, then we don't need to, we don't need to score it. So this is called safe to rank key. That means that you can stop scoring documents and you won't damage the effectiveness down to rank K because you will perfectly score all the documents above rank K and the documents below rank K, you may have scored them you may have only partly scored them, you may not have scored them at all, but you don't care because no user is ever going to look past K.
Okay, so there are, there are two well-known dynamic pruning methods called max score and wand. And I'm going to, go in, going to go into the details a little about these so you understand them. Can, you, can I just interrupt? So what's happening if uh, some user goes beyond 20? So you can, so you can change, k, the k, clearly k is, I'm choosing k equals 20 as a um, partly arbitrary choice, okay? You could, so for instance, if say 20 is the first page, you click next, it might be that the retrieval system rescores for k equals 40. Okay? So you, you would, um, so you, most users only look at the first page, um, so you could say the system, I'm going, to I'm going to score the first k equals 20 results. The user clicks on the next page, the system might say, right, well, I don't have results 20 to 40, let me just rerun the query for k equals 40. What, uh, what typically happens, and you'll see that in about 10 or 15 minutes, is that this is just one part of the retrieval process, um, and um, k might, the k here might be much larger, like a thousand, and then we're going to rescore things a bit more later on to make the top 20. So this, um, in a search engine, it might be k equals a thousand, it might be k equals five thousand. Um, even for k equals five thousand, there's a huge efficiency benefit in skipping documents that would never ever have made it into that that k set. Okay, so the there's two fairly well known methods uh, for for dynamic pruning. Okay, so one is called max score. And its, it's, its aim is to do early termination. It does not compute the scores for documents <coughs> that won't be retrieved. Okay? And it does this by comparing the, what's called upper bounds with the current score threshold. So the, score, the current score threshold is the score at which a document has to reach to make it into the retrieve set. And the upper bounds or is the maximal value that a term might get, a, a posting might get, okay? The second one, and I'll go into the details of both of them in a second, is called WAND, which stands for weighted AND, okay? So WAND does approximate evaluation. It does not consider documents where the sum of the upper bounds is lower than the threshold i.e. what it means is it tries to work out what terms must occur for this document to be retrieved and then it focuses on just those terms. Okay, so let me look at the details of, show you the details of max score first and then we'll see a, a bit more about what, okay? So here, here is my example. I have a query with two terms, arbitrary called term one and term two. Let's say that we're waiting for BM25 and we're just looking for k equals 20 documents. Now, we're halfway through our retrieval process. We've got a ranking of documents. We've already got 20 documents. And the score of the 20th document is 4.5. And these are the next postings to process in the posting list for Term 1 and Term 2. Okay, so... This number here, the, current, the score of the current 20th ranked document is our score threshold. 4.5 is the number at which documents have to exceed to get over that. So I'm going to put 4.5 in there, that's the current threshold. Now in the lexicon, we've stored the upper bounds. So if you apply BM25 for term 1, the highest score you can get is four. So if I was to look at the entire posting list for term one, look at all the different frequencies, the highest score possible is four. For term two, it's a much, the upper bound is much lower. That probably means the posting list for term two is much longer. It's a document with a much lower IDF. It's not an informative term. Okay, so it's got a much lower upper bound. Okay, so 
We're doing document at a time processing. That means we look at both of the postings for document 21 at the same time. Okay, so we're on document 21. And then we're going to look at the upper bound. So I filled in the possible scores for term one and term two for this document. So term one and term two are both there. Okay, so term one is less than equal to four, term two is less than equal to one, so the total summation is less than equal to five. So that's, all, that's greater than the threshold, so it could make the top K. So we now, we now have to go and score the document. So I've run BM25 and it's given me 3.1 and 0 0.9. That gives me a total score of 4, which doesn't exceed the threshold. So I'm not going to put that in to the top K. In fact, I could have stopped after processing term 1. Like there, was, there, was, there was no need to process term 2 for this document. On to, doc, on to the next document, document 25. It doesn't contain term 1. And I know that from term 2, the highest score that document 25 could get is 4.5, it, it is, is 1. So it will never make the top K. So we can prune that document straight away. We don't have to score any postings for that document. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Right. Wand is fairly similar, okay? So one focuses on the combination of terms that are needed to reach the threshold. So in this example, with a given that the current threshold is 4.5, any document that does not contain term one cannot make the retrieved set. So that means, for instance, we would never ever score document 25 in the term 2 posting list. In fact, one focuses on retrieval using just term 21. And it only scores term, term 2 for documents that, that could exceed the threshold. So. One would go, I'm going to score document 21 as it contains term 1. And it contains term 2. So this document is worthy of scoring. The next document I would score is not document 25, but the next document that contains both of the query terms. So it's taken what was a disjunctive retrieval, that means an or. The query used to be an or, but it's saying... Given on the weights that we have on these query terms, this is now an AND query. I'm looking for documents that contain both of the query terms so that they will to make the retrieve set. Okay, so the final point I want to say is for both max score and wand, smaller k means faster retrieval. Okay? So why? If you have a smaller k, so say that k was only 19, then the threshold would be higher. And that means it is able to prune even more. OK? So in fact, the smaller the threshold, so the smaller the k, the higher the threshold, the more that it, the more that it skips. But remember, it doesn't skip any document that would be retrieved above rank k. It guarantee, both guarantee that all the documents above rank K will have their correct score. So, WAND is really good because it's able to completely skip some documents. And this has advantages in compression. In fact, you get some compression stru compressed inverted structures that you don't, that it would, would, wouldn't even need to decode the postings. Okay, so I'm going to show you how much um, WAND and Max score help. So I've taken uh, the Clue Web collection. It's a corpus of 50 million documents. Uh, this is category B from the Trek web track. And I'm retrieving K equals 1,000 documents from BM25. And I took 1,000 
queries from a real search engine. Okay. Um, now, the numbers here, they're a bit bigger than what you as a user would be expecting, but they're still indicative of what the benefits you would gain um, on, a, on a real search engine. So if I was to do exhaustive document at a time, that means I score every single posting for every query term. Um, the response time is about 1.36 seconds. There's a gain of about a tenth of a second using max score, and it only scores 50% of the postings. If I, if I look at WAND, WAND gives me sub-second retrieval, and it only scores 10% of the postings. So there's a significant benefit in reducing the number of postings scored. I notice that the improvement in the response time is not linear. There's clearly one has to do some extra work to get that gain in terms of posting scored, but it still benefits in response time. So this is us for uh, safe to rank 1,000. Um, Wand and Max score can both be configured to be faster by un but unsafe. That means it might occasionally miss a document that it should have done. And some search engines choose to configure Wand that way. And it, do it does that by over-inflating the threshold. But generally, with a K setting, um, dynamic pruning is a, great, is a great way to improve the efficiency of a search engine because it doesn't damage effectiveness. If you say, I want a thousand documents, then one will give you a thousand documents as would be had it scored everything. So, next part I'm going to talk about is compression. So, the previous two approaches make retrieval faster by scoring fewer documents. But we, we can also benefit the scoring of, make the scoring of each document faster. Okay, so this can be achieved by applying index, comp by some form of compression. So it, physic it takes time to read posting lists. If they're on disk, then you're trying to read them off disk as quickly as possible, um, but it's only going to give you so much bandwidth. And even for indexes that are stored in memory, it mem the memory bandwidth can be your bottleneck. Okay, so if we use compressed layouts for the term posting list, this can save us space, and it can also reduce the amount of time spent in reading the index. But when I say compression, I don't mean using something like .zip files or something. Compression can be expensive, so we need an appropriate compression algorithm that can help us. So, let's take this um, example posting list at the bottom. It's just three postings long, um, and if you took one, in, if you used a full integer, 32-bit integer, and now 32 bits is four bytes, so you're talking about 24 bytes just to record um, three terms in a posting list. So that, that's actually quite a lot. And what I'll do is I'll show you some tricks that are used to make uh, make smaller compressed indexes. So, usually we store indexes in ascending order of doc ID. So that means it's possible to take gaps. Okay? So, we leave the. To, so, how would I apply a delta gap? So, we do this on the doc IDs, which is the first item in every posting. Remember, the, we've got TF, sorry, the document ID and the term frequency. So if we were to apply gaps, 25 becomes 4, because that's the gap between 21 and 25, and 26 becomes 1, because that's the gap between 25 and 26. Okay, so we can make the numbers smaller, and represent these using less bits, but we can... But are we going to use a fixed number of bits? No, because 32 bits is too large. It gives us far too many. So let's look a wee bit more into the kind of standard compression. So the most 
a very kind of commonly used compression is, called, is, ali is alias uni unary and gamma encoding. Now these are encodings that do not use a fixed number of bits for every integer. Okay. In fact, the format themselves define the length of ev of the, for every integer, so you don't need to use a fixed size for each number. So unary encoding is really simple. You use as so in bits, in bit terms, you're using as many zeros as the input value, followed by a one. So we can encode the number five in five bits. We can encode the number one or two in just a few bits. In just in just a few bits. Okay. So good for really small numbers like one or two or three. Okay. Gamma is a wee bit more useful for slightly larger numbers, okay? So let, um, what we do is we separate it down into the power and the, and, and the remainder, okay? So let n equals, but let n be the highest number of, the highest power of two that x contains. And you can calculate n as being log base two and take the four. So you calculate that, you write that out in unary, and then you write the remainder out in binary. So, 5, well, 2 to the 4, sorry, 2 squared is, is a, 2 squared is 4, so we write 0, 0, 1, and then the remainder is 1, so we write 0, 1. Okay, so if we were to take our example posting list from a couple of minutes ago, we can represent that as in gaps, so what does that give us? So the first number is a big one, that's the start of the posting list, the first one, so um, we write, so uh, it's 21, and that actually becomes eight bits. You write the TF in unary, that's just three bits. So in total, if we use gamma compression for the doc IDs and TF for the, and the TFs using unary, we're down to 20 bits. So less than three bytes down from 24 bytes. So there's a huge space saving compared to some kind of fixed size integers. Um, so I think that shows you an idea of how much compression can help in terms of space. Um, but they're actually, gamma and unary are, are, are actually quite expensive to decode. There's lots of bit twiddling and it's, it's, not, it's not that fast. Um, there are some other schemes. Uh, variable byte is quite commonly used. Um, simple, I think Barla mentioned. The other th way of, treat of doing compression is by recognizing that the documents are often clustered in the inverted index. So they're clustered, that means Documents, can, documents near to each other on the posting list contain similar terms. So that means you quite often get little runs of very small numbers. So if we treat compression as blo as in for blocks of numbers rather than just one integer at a time, we can make gains in terms of compression. So um, frame of reference, I'll give you, I'll show you what that looks like. The most the more modern implementation is called patch frame of reference. So, these are what we call list adaptive techniques. They work on blocks of numbers. So, in frame of reference, instead of just dealing, instead of the larger the larger numbers that are further from zero taking up a larger space, we have we we pick a range of numbers. So you look at the block of numbers you're compressing, you see its range is this. I can implement that range using B bits. And then just cut. So then you deduct from, um, you deduct the range from your numbers and encode them that way. So that's, that's actually really simple. Um, however, frame of reference is sensitive to outliers. Say that most of your numbers are between one and five, and you have one number that is a thousand or a million, then your range is going to be extremely large and you're going to be using bits unnecessarily. 
So that's where this, the modern patched frame of reference comes from, and that's used in lots of search engines these days. Patched frame of reference takes the outliers and encodes them separately using something like variable byte. Okay, I'm an empiricalist, did I mention that? I'm going to show you some numbers so that you believe what I'm talking about, okay? So I took this web corpus again, um, it has 12 billion postings. So that has 12 billion uh, term ID pairs in the inverted file, okay? Um, that results, if, you, if I was to encode that at 32 bits per integer, remember there's two integers for every posting, then that's a 100 gigabyte inverted file. I would like to have given you some numbers for that. I didn't have two weeks to run the experiment, so I, we didn't bother. Instead, I'll give you the kind of um, some more indicative experiments. So, um, the gamma and unary compression, um, you can do better than that in terms of time by, for instance, compressing the doc IDs using frame of reference. Or, um, instead of using unary for the term frequencies, you use frame of reference as well. So you can do better than that but you sacrifice a little in terms of the size of the index. So, both, so all, of, all of these numbers are compressed indices, and you can see that we can make a trade-off between the space usage of the index versus the retrieval time. Um, and these list adaptive algorithms, for instance, for and P for delta, they give us slightly larger indices, but they give us improved uh, efficiency times. So I should mention, this is actually, these results come from a paper by Matteo. Matteo's here. You can talk to Matteo if you have some, any more questions about these numbers. Okay. Um, the numbers are cumulative. So if you use four for both doc IDs and term frequencies you'd expect on order of a 13% improvement in speed. Okay, so that, that's the main aspects I'm covering in terms of efficient query evaluation. So I looked at caching, I looked at dynamic pruning, and I looked at compression. And these are all essential components of an efficient IR system. Okay, each form gives you improvements to efficiency without really damaging the effectiveness. I've looked, there are other techniques that I haven't, uh, I didn't have time to include. One of the things um, that's interesting is I've only spoken so far about doc ID ordered posting lists. An alternative representation is changing the order of posting lists so that the documents with the highest weight come first in the posting list. Um, there are different ways of doing that, there are different trade-offs, um, you can give a look. And it's also possible to integrate one more tightly with the format of the index so that um, it, it works on just blocks and it knows about the upper bound that will occur in that block of the index. Okay, so... We've talked about efficiency techniques. Now I want to talk about increasing the effectiveness of search engine um, using line to rank, but doing that efficient, efficiently, okay? So, um, motivations for learning. The line to rank is a, it's become really popular in the last kind of five or six years. Um, there are motivations, well, there is a plethora of weighting models. You've probably seen 10 or 20 already this week, okay? Um, they have different assumptions about how relevant documents should be retrieved. They have varying effectiveness. Some are good for some queries, some for others. There are different, there are also other sources of evidence that can be used. We can say that a term occurring in an anchor text might be more important. A term occurring in a title might be more important. Terms occurring close to each other are important. Documents with high page ranks are important, and that these might vary for long queries or difficult queries or queries that contain locations. So, 
with all these different sources of evidence, it, it's, it's impossible that we as humans could come up with ways to, to give good weights for each of these evidence. So we've resorted to machine learning techniques. So to help us combine all of these appropriately, that means efficient, efficiently and effectively. So the observation behind this is that ranking can be done as what we might call a cascading process. So the idea is that we've got billion, potentially billions of documents in which one or more of the query terms has a match. What we want to do is identify which of those documents we think are appropriate to, to look at in more detail. And then keep doing that again. So each, each time we apply the cascade, we're trying to identify a set of documents that we want to examine in more detail. Okay? Why? Because all these features we mentioned here are expensive to compute. Much more expensive than just simply saying, does the query term occur or not? So in fact, this, um, this cascading triangle came from a talk by Jan Pedersen. Um, who used to be an important man at Bing and now works for Google, I believe. Um, so, you have a cascade, I'm going to do it. So, for a given query, I'm going to look at billions of documents and simply say, do the query terms occur or not? Identify a set of documents that are most likely to have a reasonable recall. That means contain some set of relevant documents. And then I'm going to re-rank those again to get that into a really, into a really good set. So how might we do that? Well, the first stage is really doing something like WAND. Do the query terms occur in this document or not? The next cascade is I'm going to apply something like BM25 and eliminate a great swathe of those documents. And then the focus of what I'm going to talk about now is learning to rank. How can we get that top 20 documents that we give to the user really, really good? Not just relevant, but it gives us the most perfect relevant answer right at the top. So, learning to write. An application of specialised machine learning to automatically select and weight the retrieval features. So we've got our test collection that we've got some queries and we've labelled the documents for. We can use that to learn which, of the, which features are appropriate and how much they should be weighted. So it's been popularised by several commercial search engines, um, I think driven by the people at Microsoft, really. Um, the Barla mentioned Foundations and Trends in Information Retrieval. Uh, the Tian Lu reference, Foundation and Trends, I think it's 2009. Um, it's seminal, it's very math heavy, but it's worth giving a look at if you want to get into the nitty gritty. Um, so we're using large training data sets, possibly instantiated using, the, using records of user behaviour um, to learn which features are appropriate. So how does it work? We're going to, I, what we're trying to do is identify a sample of documents, maybe using BM25 alone, and right, we can call this the sample or, 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 the, or the, the, the initial cascades. And your hope is that this sample contains enough relevant documents. So if you're looking at techniques to, uh, to, to, to make the sample, uh, you'd be looking at recall, uh, each of the techniques recall. Once you've got a sample, you compute more features. Query dependent features like more weighting models, does the term occur in the anchor text, does the term occur in close proximity. And you also load in at that point the query independent features. Does it have a high page rank score? Is it, does it have a low spam score? How, what it, does it, is its URL length short if you're looking for home pages? Has the domain been registered for a long time and is hence reputable? Now, this is where the retrieval system differentiates between offline and on online. Now, in an offline, we would run this for our batch of queries on our test collection. We would get some, we would put, insert the labels, and then we would learn our ranking model. 
once we have a ranking model, we can apply that to re-rank the documents for an unseen query. So, schematically that would look like that. We've got our query, we give that to WAND. WAND identifies the documents that contain the query terms and applies VM25. So based on our, inver on our compressed inverted index and it passes K documents onto the next stage. I had this chat with Fabrizio a couple of minutes ago. Probably K might be something like a thousand documents, 5,000, 10,000. I'll speak about that in a minute. Um, once we have that set of documents, we're going to compute more features. The proximity, um, does, the, does the term occur in the title? We might refer to some repository of feature information. And then we pass that on and apply our learned model. That's the outcome of our offline learn to rank process. That tells us how, to, how we rank the, the set of documents based on these features. Where did we get that learned model? We got it from a learn to rank technique that was trained offline. And our training data is, it uses the same two steps plus some relevance assessments. So how did you obtain this training data? Did you a test collection. A test. a test collection. Usually these test collections are, have to be fairly big, um, depending on the type of learner. And I'll, let me come back to that in a wee minute. So the input to the learner looks something, something like this. We've got some query dependent features. That means weighting models, anything that uses the query. Proximity, okay? And that represents one column of this document by feature matrix. You've got query independent features, things like page rank, URL length, how spammy the document is. Does it come from Wikipedia? Is it a PDF? So anything where we're considering the document but not the query. And the last type of feature is not actually about the, the document itself, but it's about the query. Things that might help the learner decide. For instance, if you have a long query, then proximity might have to be a bit softer. Or if you have detected an entity, then proximity might, might, should, should be applied strong, more strongly. Is this a difficult query? Is this an easy query? These are all little signals that the learner can, can use to adapt its model for different queries. So, there are two commonly used types of learned models. The simplest one is just a linear model. A linear combination of feature values, each with an appropriate weight. And it's that WF that the learner is, is providing you with. So your learned model is just a vector of feature weights that tells you how important is this feature for when processing queries. Okay. So a linear model is very efficient to apply, but it does have some limitations. A linear model assumes that the same features are needed for all queries. There's no chance to generalize your model for, for instance, long queries. And it's also quite limiting in model form. Okay? So for instance, if something more advanced like a genetic algorithm might be able to learn a functional form, i.e. dividing <coughs> feature A by feature B. There's no such potential in a linear model, but it's, it's, it's actually quite effective and it, um, it's easy to learn. In more common use now are regression trees. So a regression tree is a series of decisions leading to a partial score. Okay, so here's, a, here's an example. Um, this, tree, regression tree here. So it, it, the tree, says, say, for instance, at the top says, is the URL length greater than 20? Yes. If so, 
Can you look at BM25? Is BM25 greater than 10? Yes, then the score for this document should be 2.9. Otherwise, it should be 1.9, or if we were not in this branch, if we're over in this branch, then it should be 2.3. So that is a regression tree learned. Okay? So the outcome of applying a learn is a forest of many such trees. And you apply this full forest of trees for each document in your ranking set. Okay, so I've got maybe a thousand trees. For every document in my cave equals a thousand, I calculate the features and I apply I apply each of the trees to them, summing up the uh, summing up the, the, the leaf node values that we get from each tree. And that gives me the final score for that document. Okay? Um, now, they have this, because it's a decision tree, it lets us do things like it can say, oh, this is a long query, apply proximity much more strongly. Um, and it's certainly used by several major search engines. Uh, Microsoft used something called Lambda Mart, and they, in fact, Microsoft used Lambda Mart, Yahoo run, ran a competition on learning to rank. Microsoft took part with Lambda Mart and won Yahoo's competition. Um, the Russian search engine also have something that's fairly similar to Lambda Mart. So it's very effective. It's considered to be the state of the art. Okay. So back to this cascade. So we've got WAND at the bottom, then BM25, then LANG to RANK. What kind of decisions can we make in our implementation of this cascade that could make things more efficient without damaging effectiveness too much? Okay? So we can look at the type of retrieval we do in the first stage. Remember I said that WAND is faster when you have less documents. So how many documents should we be re-ranking? And can we apply that model efficiently? Okay, so I'm going to look at each of these um, three, three aspects in turn. Okay, starting at the bottom. So, um, candidate generation. So, we want to identify quickly our candidate documents, that's our sample, in the first cascade so that we can go and score them further. We want to have a high enough recall, but small enough that one can do it quickly. Okay? Typically, IR is focused on disjunctive query processing, and that, that's comparatively slow. In fact, um, there's some research, I am thinking of a paper from Asadi and Jimmy Lynn Sigar, 2013, that showed on Trek data, if you just did conjunctive processing, it was enough to identify the first set before you then apply the re-ranking. So in other words, your first set of um, documents only contains those that contain all of the query terms. Okay. Then we're getting some documents. How many? How many should we use? So remember that max score and wand. The smaller the K, the faster they become. So how how few can we get away with? Um, so we did some experiments and it's in an, uh, the Journal of Information Retrieval and they looked at how many documents that you would re-rank, that's all on the bottom. And we put them into different line to rank techniques, which are the different lines, and we recorded the, the, out, the performance, okay? Different line to rank techniques. So clearly if you have a small, s small set of documents, you have degraded performance, the recall is quite low, and when you re-rank, there's not enough there to pick up. As the sample size increases, performance increases, but there's no real benefit for having a sample much larger than 1,000 or 5,000 documents. Uh, this is on Trek web track data. Okay, so 1,000 to 5,000 documents 
actually appeared to be enough. But the answer varied from query to query. So there's been a few approaches looking at how to vary the K on a per query basis. If the query is easy, maybe you think BM25 probably got the answer pretty good, then you can have a small K. If it's a difficult query, maybe you're going to rely more on the other features so you can take a bigger K for re-ranking. Um, we might deploy a number of query dependent features such as weighting models and proximity. So we want the result set that we're passing to the learned model to have all of the query dependent features computed. Once that, but it's too expensive to compute all features for all documents um, that are processed by WAND. Um, and remember that inverted files aren't really random access. You can't go back into them and say, give me the results for just these 20 documents. It would take too long. So um, a kind of infrastructure technique that Terrier takes is um, it allows you to keep the postings around so that you can s add more features later for the documents that you care about that, that make the sample, okay? So let, let me put that in graphical terms. So we've got a query, and we've got an inverted index, and we're applying WAND or some kind of other document at a time retrieval process. Okay? We get our results set. We've scored K equals 1,000 documents, and we know the scores of those documents. So the interior, what we do is we also keep around the postings that match those query terms and keep it just beside the results. So we're fattening the, the result set with more information, the postings. And this means that we can apply more features later on in the retrieval process without having to go back here into the inverted index. Because the inverted index isn't, because it's so highly compressed, it's not really designed for random access. So you, you want to still be able to apply all those features. And then, of course, once you've applied line to rank, you can re-rank your documents into your final result set. Okay, so I mentioned that um, regression trees were the most commonly deployed line to rank model these days. Um, so here's another example tree. How would we encode this within the search engine? So if I was to C, it might look something like this. If x2 is less than 0 0.5, if x0 is less than 0 0.9 as in this branch, and I return the value of L0. Else do this, else do some other pattern. So that, that would... Um, that would be how you could apply a tree like that. But remember, there are thousands of regression trees make up the model for a search engine. And this makes them quite expensive to actually run. Okay? Why is that? Well, um, there are lots of if statements here. And that means that the processor is doing lots of conditional branches. And that's really bad for, ca for the processor's cache. It ca can't really do with branches. So it's, you're blowing the cache of the processor every time. It's, going, it's having to go somewhere else and somewhere else. Okay. So um, there's a couple of recent papers that have looked at how you could make this tree traversal much faster. Okay. So for instance, um, Asadi and Lin looked at vectorization. Okay, so there's a kind of key observation here. They've transformed control hazards like if statements into data hazards like this. Okay, so that's, that's one observation. The second observation is that they've put the statements to do with one node of the tree. They've done four of them at the same time. Okay. 
why have they done that? Well, modern processors are good at vectorization. So while the processor is away trying to, waiting for memory to look up the instruction for this one, it can move on, it can start doing the next one and start doing the next one. So it's actually much better for the cache of the, set, the, cache of the CPU in terms of, it can, it, it can, you've unrolled the loop, you're dealing with one node of the tree at the same time and it's doing multiple documents at the same time. So in this case, the vectorization really helps the CPU. Um, or the SIGIR best paper two weeks ago in Chile was about exactly the same problem. How can we make tree traversal better? And they, used, they, they also used a kind of vectorization, but they also represented the tree nodes as bit vectors, which had a couple of ad advantages. So the references are in my slides. The slides will be available online. But this is a really important problem when you've got these thousands of trees. How can you apply um, these trees as quickly as possible? Okay, so line to rank bit. We can re-rank the retrieved, retrieved documents in cascades to increase effectiveness. So we're able to use additional ranking features, the query dependent ones, the query independent ones, as well as things like query features. Okay, But we, we can't do that for all documents during retrieval. We have to cut down the number of documents that we're considering at each stage. So, and you want to cut down documents as quickly as possible without damaging effectiveness. So, conjunctive retrieval, some results show that that's possible to do. Um, for the last cascade, recent research has been looking at how we can apply regression trees to re-rank the documents in a, more, in a quicker fashion. So, that's the kind of infrastructure of learning to rank. There's a machine learning lecture on Thursday. Um, uh, Katja will, I'm sure, fill you in in more of the details on how the learning to rank techniques work and how they calculate the best model. What I was trying to show you here was how they are applied and the necessary infrastructure within the system to deal with them. So, um, the more things that you add to your search engine, the slower it might become. Um, and how can, you, how, can, how can we deal with this? So, I'll talk a bit in the next section about scaling up the retrieval system. Um, either making it, adding more machines or making it, adding more horsepower. So, in the search is computationally and uh, input out in intensive and we may just not have enough power. So to satisfy high query loads, the retrieval process can be spread over many CPUs and storage backends. So like many problems, there are two ways to scale up. We can scale horizontally by buying a large machine with lots of uh, storage. But the search way tends to be vertical, buying many machines and distributing the search processes over them. So um, vertical scaling, why would that why would it be good? Well, all resources are local to the processing, but I mean some applications don't really lend themselves well to a distributed computing model. And the disadvantages are that you really need expensive infrastructure and the kind of fault tolerance is difficult to achieve. Horizontal scaling has been widely used in search engines. You can add more machines in a very ad hoc manner as you need more processors. Um, but there is some disadvantages in terms of the additional communication coordination overheads are incurred. Okay. So, I will talk about different horizontal scalings that occur in a search engine and some of the challenges that arise in addressing from these disadvantages. Okay, so 
Horizontal scaling is used by large churches to parallelize the indexing processes and the index itself. So for instance, we have our corpus and we split our big index into lots of smaller indexes called shards. Then when the query comes, we, um, we can deal with the query on different index shards. We can also replicate each shard multiple times to allow for multiple queries to be processed and for fault tolerance reasons. So I'll show you how that happens both at the retrieval stage and then also the indexing stage. So if we want to partition the index across many machines, how can we do this? But let's think of our index in terms of that matrix again, okay? So we have a document by term matrix. Each row represents a given document and each column represents the occurrence, uh, where that indexing term occurs. So one option might be term partitioning. Different nodes, or which, which we call query servers, are associated to different terms. So maybe query server 1 gets A to J, query server 2 gets K, K to Q, R to Z, etc. So that would mean a partitioning a bit like this. We've partitioned down through the terms. Okay? So during query processing, different queries touch different query servers depending on where the terms that they deal with occur on the, on the different servers. Okay? So we can spread the querying load across different servers. The other option is document partitioning. That means different documents are allocated across the different query servers. And then during query processing, each, each query server executes the query. So the load is then evenly spread on each query server. And then the results from each server is combined into a final result set. So in terms of a, of a conceptual architecture, it might look like this. We have a query. The query goes into a broker. The broker contacts each contacts the, the appropriate query servers and collates the top K results before passing them back to the user. Of course, we can replicate the query server to increase throughput and to increase fault tolerance. Okay, so how would that work for term partitioning? So for, document, so for document partitioning, we would collect, if we wanted K results, we would collect K results from each of the query servers. For term positioning, for term partitioning, the broker would collect all results from each query. Okay, so not just K results, all results. Why? Because a document with a low score on some terms may have a high score on other terms. Do you remember back in one we had some low IDF terms, we had some high IDF terms, so. If you, if you distribute by term, you need to get even the low scoring query terms, the, the, the documents with the low scoring terms, and get their results and merge them with the good, with, with the important terms. So this is actually a key disadvantage of term partitioning. In fact, it's rarely used in, practicing, in practice. The only, really w the only really plausible way that you can do it is a pipelining architecture where you deal with the most informative query terms first, you, and you pass the result set on to the next query server that deals with the less common terms, and then on to the next one. So a kind of pipelining approach. And that's much more difficult to scale. So you know, these, these hybrid architectures aren't, aren't real. Uh, sorry, the, 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 the term partitioning isn't used so much. Okay, so document partitioning. Um, a few, a variety of strategies exist. Um, you can actually just distribute the documents randomly. It's good for efficiency on the large collections because all queries touch all partitions. But if you 
distributed documents randomly, you would um, your index compression would be much worse because documents wouldn't be clustered together. Another way of doing it is um, if the collection is already organised into kind of meaningful sub-collections, you, you can have separate indexes for each of those. For instance, an index for news, an index for tweets, an index for images as well as and, and web pages. Okay? If we're doing that, then we want each collection to be well separated such that the query maps to a distinct collection containing the largest number of relevant documents. So, for instance, it's quite common in web search engines to have language distribution. Okay? And this also permits geographically distributed data centers. For instance, if I want, I, I'm going to keep the Chinese index in Hong Kong because that's, because that's close to where most of the people are accessing it. I can keep the, the European languages in European data centers, etc. Okay? We can also um, cluster documents the, by the queries that touch them to make more coherent clusters of documents and use them to distribute the collection. So if we've done those, then we need to decide which partitions, which shards can answer a query. So um, kind of this is kind of moving into what's called aggregated search these days. Okay? So we take a query and we're trying to decide which index should we look at. So there's a couple of things. You can look at the corpus. So a resource selection technique tries to predict if it thinks this index is good for answering this query. Okay? So for instance, it, it might, you can use it to, for instance, say, it, does our news index have information about this topic? An alternative approach is to, see, is to learn from user behavior. Okay? If a sub-collection is good for a query, then we can, then we present, so we present results, for instance, present news results to the user, see if the user clicks on it. If, if they do click on it, then you learn that this might be a good index for this query. So present the user with news results, see if they click. If they don't click, then decide if, I get, if in the future you need to present news results for this query. Large search engines need hundreds of thousands of query servers. So um, this represents a significant consumption of power on a global scale. They are installing data centers near to cheap energy and appropriate temperature climates. Um, so you can think that having efficient IR is a contribution towards information retrieval being green in nature. So if you keep your search engines as efficient as possible, it has more throughput, therefore you need less servers, therefore you're paying less money to the energy suppliers. Um, some modern trends in keeping up efficiency. Trying to find the query servers that are least busy, um, or changing the effectiveness efficiency trade-off according to the query expense or the current volume of queries being processed by the search engine. Or this, uh, the last one is a technique that Bing are currently deploying called selective parallelization. If the query is expensive, that means the posting lists are long, then the search engine will decide to use multiple processors to process that query on, one, on, on the one query server. If the query is short, the query is easy, it knows straight away that it, a single processor will still allow that query to be answered within the target time, say 0.2 seconds. Okay, so distributed retrieval environments permit, permit efficient retrieval across large-scale collections and are particularly applicable in, in web-scale search engines. Um, so we've talked about some partitioning schemes and resource selection 
uh, document versus term partitioning, etc. Um, how to decide which part of the index you should examine through resource selection and how to address efficiency in a distributed environment. So, given that, we've, that we believe that distributed retrieval is the appropriate way to handle large-scale retrieval, how can we generate distributed indexes? Um, so, indexing is a, is, is, a, is a massive scale problem. We could be dealing with billions or, if you believe some blog post trillions of documents, okay? Um, so this use of horizontal scaling has been popularized using, for instance, the MapReduce paradigm um, as for batch processing of large data sets over multiple machines. So the idea is fairly straightforward. We have many tasks involving a simple map opera operation over each record in a large data set. Okay, we're index, so um, we can do this, use it for indexing, we can use it for hyperlink analysis, we can use it for spam detection. Okay, um, we can map, so what is the key idea behind MapReduce? We're going to apply a function over each record in the data, and then in reducing, we can sort, partition, and merge the results into our final data set. That doesn't mean it's for retrieval operations. It's a batch. It's for batch operations, such as for indexing. Okay. Um, now, Google invented this MapReduce paradigm, but um, the Hadoop one is a popular open source implementation. It's in Java, and there's a few IR systems now that have integrated support for Hadoop. Um, so this is uh, how the Terrier implementation works. Um, so it, it can be described in MapReduce like this. So we're taking our input collection of documents and we divide it into little bits. Okay? Those little bits are farmed out to different machines and the map task op so and on each machine there's a map and then the results are collated and the reduce is performed. Okay? The mapping, we take a document um, and we process it and we build up knowledge of the posting lists that apply for this just tiny little split of the corpus. Okay. When memory is full we output each term and the partial posting list that we've built up. We can then sort and group those posting lists together by term and then they're passed to the reducers and each reducer takes in the terms and it takes in a set of posting lists and it applies the normal index compression such that you get one index shard per reducer. So the reduced task combines all of the partial posting lists for a single term. It does that over all of the terms to make a single shard. So let me do this schematically as well. Okay. So we take our standard indexing pipeline and we're going to break it into these two components. We've got the document collection and what we do to that document. We split our document collection into different splits and each of those splits is passed to a map task that does things like the tokenization, applies the stemming, the other transformations uh, and builds up a small posting list for that split. So that's what happens on the map on, on each map task. So each map task, when it finishes, outputs the terms and posting lists that apply for that split of the collection. These are then merged to make a one index shard per reduce task. So By dealing with posting lists at the map stage, we can we know that posting lists are very compressible. We've already shown that. So Terry uses compressed posting lists as output from the map task. This reduces the amount of intermachine traffic and, make, and makes a, a fast indexing process. 
So, challenge is that MapReduce is a batch orientated paradigm. Okay? MapReduce jobs process a fixed set of input data. Okay? Once it's started, you can't change the documents that it's processing. So, if it's a store then process model. So, the disadvantages. These complex tasks are difficult to represent as maps and reduces. You might have to, so if you're, if you're trying to do a complex task, it might be difficult to represent. You might have to chain, you might, you might wish to chain them together. It's also, you can have very high latency um, because it's a batch orientated task. You need to build your batch before your processing can start. So it's not well suited to things like doing document retrieval. So it's not good for streaming tasks. And that's the last part of my talk. Okay. Increasingly, IR is looking at tasks that involve real-time processing. Um, tasks where we have documents arriving continually and we want to be able to serve results from these. So, modern search systems are indeed not batch orientated, but they're trying to process data more in a streaming, matter, streaming manner. Large volume documents are indexed continually over time as they are crawled. It's not the case anymore. About um, When Google first came out, it used to do what was called the Google Dance. That was once a month, the indexes would start to would, they would start the index changeover and the results would be a bit funny for a day or two and then they would finish the index and change over and you would start to get new results that's not really the case anymore we need to have uh, queries are often about things that are happening now so we need to have indexes that are continually updated over time moreover user queries arrive at very high rates and need to be processed quickly and in parallel so these are both example. These are both streaming data. We need to adapt our search architecture towards such streaming data. In fact, there are many different forms of streaming data that we might want to search. So in the last minute, I've take I've, I've done one slide, and in that last minute, there's been twenty thousand posts on Tumblr. There's been where are the tweets? 1,700 downloads of Firefox, 50 new WordPress installations, 100 new LinkedIn accounts, and 168 million emails sent. So, there are lots of tasks in which streaming, streaming search is appropriate. So, thousands, need, thousands of documents need to be processed every second. And the stream input rate is not constant. Um, so, for instance, if we wanted to search tweets, Twitter receives about 5,000 tweets a second, um, but it can receive bursts of up to 12,000 tweets a second, for instance, during the Super Bowl. And people are searching for tweets during the Super Bowl, about the Super Bowl, so you need to, you need to be able to have those 12,000 tweets in the index within a couple of seconds' time. Yeah, so for example, if we're wanting to do an event detection system, there's no good detecting an event an hour after it happens because you wait until you had a batch of data and you stuck that into your MapReduce system. Twitter, users expect do new documents to be searchable, searchable immediately. Therefore, we need a processing time that remains constant for each input item. So dealing with these dealing with these streams in an efficient manner that with bounds on when that on when the processing will complete. So if we're dealing with search on streams, how might we adapt the classical search architecture for streaming data? So conceptually, not much changes. Instead of having a collection of documents, documents arrive in a stream. And of course our queries are always streaming in. But in terms of the implementation, we need our index to be continually updated over time with new documents. And what normally happens is this involves breaking 
the index down into multiple shards, some of which are held in memory and that can be updated. So, the documents are added, so when we're indexing a stream of documents, the documents are added to the index immediately and are searchable immediately. So we're applying our normal indexing transformations and when that, given the indexed form of the document, we add it into our current index shard. Assuming the shard's held in memory, when, but it's, so it's therefore limited in capacity. So when that index shard is finished, we rotate it onto, we rotate onto a new index shard. So we always have one index shard that we are adding new documents to and other index shards that are older that are now read-only. Once all of our shards are full, we need to make a decision what to do. It might be that the oldest documents are discarded. Up until quite recently, Twitter only let, used to let you search um, within the last couple of months in terms of the age of the tweets. Or we could move the older indexes onto cheaper or slower indexing sto index storage tiers. So what's the assumption here? The assumption is in such real-time tasks that the user is interested mainly in recent documents. If the documents are old, they're of no use, there's likely been newer documents so that we can discard them. In terms of retrieval, well, the retrieval is distributed across all of the available shards and the, the partial results from each index are merged to generate the results. So, this is just document partitioning, right? Document partitioning over time. We gather, all, we gather results from the indexes that we have, but we may focus more on the more recent indexes. We may have some kind of, for instance, a ranking prior that says focus on documents that are most recent. So this document partition retrieval, we're returning results back to the broker that send those for re-ranking and pre presenting to the user. So um, here's a wee bit of details about the um, the early bird search infrastructure, which was the Twitter search engine as circa 2011, and it's published in an ICDE paper. Okay, so there was um, one early bird server contained multiple index shards. One was the active index shard, that's the one that's currently being written to. Okay, and it supports read and write operations. The remainder are index shards that are now read-only and have been optimised. That means that the more, for instance, more compression has been applied. Okay, so each time that an active shard becomes full, it's, it's converted and optimised um, but held in memory. Now, it was a distributed retrieval system. Twitter were using 12 servers to support um, all of their search um, in parallel and the tweets were document partitioned across each of these uh, machines based on their tweet ID. To enable the processing of very high rate document and query streams, the index structures need to be efficient. So, um, Twitter used a fairly unusual posting list format to make document edition as fast as possible. So remember our classical term posting list structure. We have IDs and term frequencies. Okay. Now, what makes a tweet unusual? Somebody. Short, okay. What's the ramification of that in terms of these statistics? Very low term frequency. Very good. In fact, Twitter decided that they didn't need a term frequency. Terms, uh, terms reoccur 
so infrequently in tweets that they simply had repeated postings for multiple occurring tweets. So that means that instead of each of their um, each of their postings containing an ID, the document ID, the term frequency, and the position, they just simply went for the ID and the position. So if tweet number 200 contained the term twice, it got two entries in the posting list. And they could, record, they could record both of those within a single integer. So it means each posting used exactly 32 bits. So it was efficient to store and they could easily work through it from work, work through. An integer contained both the tweet ID and the position in the tweet. So it was fast to traverse, they only needed to scan memory linearly and it had fairly predictable access patterns as well which helped the hardware do prefetching. Do you remember, remember what I said? Not, not blowing our cache, helping our cache do its prefetching. Okay. The other thing they did was they pre-allocated posting lists. So um, the more that a term was observed, it, it allocated a small block, and then if it filled that block, it allocated one that was exponentially larger and exponentially larger again. Okay, so that's a wee insight into a real into a real deployed um, Twitter search infrastructure. So an example of stream processing. So. How many tweets did they keep? The last month or something like that? I think so, yeah. Um, my recollection was that it's a, it's a disk-based storage system for all the historical tweets now. Okay, so that's a fairly simple architecture, but it hides significant complexities that don't exist for, ba for batch processing. Um, we need to to distribute across multiple machines, of course, with uh, fault tolerance. Um, and it needs to be, we're, ha we're spreading indexing and search across the same machines, right? Um, we want things to be modular and flexible, but avoiding bottlenecks in particular components. In fact, we actually, what we, what we really want to do is allocate more resources during periods with high uh, high query loads or varying the document indexing versus query load processing infrastructure on the fly. So um, this leads me to the kind of last bit. What I want to say is that there are some stream processing platforms that can help with these issues. So these are platforms for scaling out horizontally stream processing tasks. And um, some of the platforms that exist are things like Storm from Apache, uh, there was the S4 platform from Yahoo, Apache Spark, IBM Info, Sphere Streams, uh, uh, Typical Stream Pace, and Apache Samza. So, um, this is, uh, Apache Storm is one that we've been looking at over the last couple of years. We found it easy to get started with, fairly active community. In fact, it came out of a company that Twitter bought. Um, we've been looking at it for the purposes of Twitter search, um, and I'll go into that a little bit more in a second. Apache Spark is more for is for real-time data processing, um, and it's really, really quickly gaining traction now. So, about Storm. Um, Storm has two forms of um, conceptual patterns, okay? It has a spout. A spout is something that creates data streams. That means it's a source of information into your topology. Your topology can contain multiple bolts. Bolts process streams and make more streams. 
the items being put, passed into the streams are comprised of tuples that they may contain a key. Okay? Um, for instance, a, a, a tuple may represent a document, it may represent a term. Um, you can use the keys to direct tuples to specific bolts or instances of a specific bolt. Okay? And then each spout or bolt can be parallelized as appropriately. So you can um, ask for more resources for a particular type of uh, bolt. The processing is done fully in memory and it's continuous. So data comes in through the spouts and works its way out. Okay. Um, so storm topologies support computation defined as a graph of interconnected processing unit. And it helps you do that kind of partition and reduce that MapReduce does. Grouping of data that's passed between bolts and spouts. So when tackling streams, Storm has the following advantages. Um, the computation is done fully in memory, okay? So faster processing, avoiding these costly disk seats that the MapReduce framework uses. Computation is continuous, documents are processed immediately as they arrive, and it avoids the startup costs that are inherent to MapReduce. For instance, in MapReduce, you have to initialize the tasks on the cluster um, as well as you're moving code to machines, starting and stopping things continually. So that's some of the costs that are inherent in MapReduce. And it has a single topology. So only um, it's possible to, to have these complex topologies in contrast to chaining together different multiple MapReduce jobs. Okay, so we did... Um, we tried to look at building a search system using Storm, and we tested that on a corpus of tweets. Um, the index initially held 600,000 tweets when uh, the querying started, and the queries were issued over a five-minute five period, during which time an additional 300,000 tweets were, were, were indexed. And what we looked at was the scalability of the platform. Could this platform still, um, could, if, we added, if we doubled the number of nodes, could it index at twice the rate? Okay, so using a cluster of machines, um, looking at the scaling performance and looking at retrieval latency. Um, so this is our scale-up graph. The, the light blue line is linear performance. That's when we, for instance, if we double the number of machines, we would expect it to double the maximum throughput that was achievable. If we, m when we multiply by 10, we, ex we hoped to get 10 times the number of, uh, 10 times the throughput. And we were very close to linear, about 9.2 times faster with 10 times more machines. Um, so it achieves very close to perfect linear scaling and with um, sub-second response times for tweet search. Okay, so that's a flavour of this kind of new area of stream processing search. Um, it introduces new challenges to information retrieval systems. That means indexing and retrieving documents as soon as they occur, dealing with high volumes and possibly bursty rates of input, bursts of tweets, bursts of queries, and also there's an additional aspect in terms of the retrieval modelling. How do we develop models to identify the new and relevant documents that are appropriate for user queries? And from an infrastructure point of view, stream processing frameworks really help us in offering methods of easily distributed streaming processing across multiple nodes. Things like Storm or even Spark. Okay, so that's the end of the stream processing section. Um, and I'm just about done. So, what I want to say is that IR has seen many years of development of systems to ensure that the retrieval is both effective and efficient. Okay? These two dimensions are a dichotomy. Many techniques that can enhance effectiveness, such as pseudo-relevance feedback, may be too expensive to deploy in large-scale systems. Um, so a real environment has to carefully choose between the most effective thing to do versus the thing that they can afford to do 
and that comes down to money. How many servers can you employ or how many uh, can you improve the efficiency of your code without losing too much effectiveness? And this has become much more apparent in, in recent years. The web search is a particularly challenging environment in terms of making sure we have efficient web, efficient web search at scale as well as real-time search where we have high velocities of information. Okay? So I've looked at a range of industry standard infrastructure techniques and some more recent research. Looked at caching and dynamic pruning. We've talked a lot about learning to rank and how, how that should be deployed to make sure we can compute the features on the least number of documents. Uh, we've looked at distributed retrieval, map reduce and stream processing. Okay, so many of the techniques that I've, de I've described are widely implemented. Some of them are implemented within open source platforms, um, such as Terrier. And as I said at the start, have a look at all the platforms that are out there. See if a particular one matches the needs of your research. But be careful in terms of developing new systems, because it, take it takes a long time to get it right. Okay, my slides will be online. Um, there were nearly 40 references in those slides that, that give you a flavour of the research that's gone into building IR infrastructures. So that's it from me. Thank you.